So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this new session of the Creative Industry Series. So this is our second session. And so just to remind you, Creative Industry is a series of conference that we organize with our master, an interior architect for student, alumni, staff, in order to give access to skills that can be useful in a future career as an interior architect. So today lecture focus on a path that maybe some of you would like to consider after graduating, meaning the academia. So the title is therefore how to engage in academia. And this can be, can be seen in a large spectrum, so teaching, but also researching and curating. And we have the pleasure today to have as an us somebody that touches, I think, all this field, Ignacio Gonzalez Galan. So thank you for accepting our invitation. He's joining directly from New York, where he's early in the morning. And uh, I will briefly introduce Ignacio and then leave the floor for a conference for about 45 minutes. And then we can have some question and answer with the people who are joining us today. So Ignacio is a New York-based architect, historian, and educator, and he's concerned with the role of architecture in the articulation of society. He studied architecture in Madrid, in Delft, and at Harvard, and he gained a PhD in architecture history and theory of architecture from Princeton, and he's currently assistant professor at Barnard and Columbia Colleges. His studies addresses the relationship between architecture, politics, and media, with a particular focus on nationalism, colonialism, and diverse form of population transiences. His research projects have resulted in a number of publications and exhibitions, including an installation for the 2014 Venice Biennale. He has co-curated an exhibition for the 2013 Lisbon Architecture Triennale, and he was also chief curator of the 2016 Oslo, Oslo Architecture Triennale. He's also an architect and he owns his own firm, design firm, that have been awarded in several competitions, including the first prize of the New Velodrome in Medellin, and are part of a permanent collection of the Pompidou Center. So without further ado, uh, welcome Ignacio, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, and welcome everybody. So let me share my screen uh, so that I can share some slides. Okay, can you see the presentation? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, well, thank you so much uh, for the invitation uh, to present uh, my work and for your introduction. Uh, even if we are getting used to uh, interacting with each other uh, through Zoom, I still feel a certain sense of displacement being here in New York with you in uh, Geneva or wherever you are dis dispersed in different interiors. Uh, and I mentioned this because it is that these kind of conditions of displacement that I've been addressing in my work in the last uh, years uh, looking at the way in which architecture mediates a pursuit of belonging in the definition of our spaces of residence. Uh, and that's what I've uh, been concerned in my work in the last years, a pursuit for new ways of being together that is characteristic uh, of a life in transit. Um, an exploration of this pursuit, uh, uh, I think, uh, requires grounding architecture practice in a reflection about history. Uh, and in fact, I work as a historian, as it was said, uh, also as a curator and as a designer, and have approached these concerns uh, through the different modes of inquiry that each of these types of practices um, uh, privileges. And you've invited me to discuss how to engage in academia. And I think we are going to have the time to talk in more detail uh, later in a seminar. So I thought that what I could do now in this lecture is to discuss the way in which some of my academic uh, endeavors, uh, particularly manifesting uh, in historical research projects, um, relate to different forms of practice that I develop also outside academia. So uh, in fact, my, my work aims to expand the forms of practice characteristic of academic settings. Uh, so I want, what I'm going to do is to structure my presentation through a sequence of historical, more kind of uh, properly academic projects, curatorial projects, and design projects, developing some trends regarding uh, diverse forms of belonging and forms of residence uh, that architecture mediates. I, I will not be talking about my teaching here, which might be uh, uh, something that we can address later in the seminar. 
So I'm going to uh, take you to different locations in this lecture, uh, but I'll start by bringing you to New York, where I teach and work. Uh, and I'll bring you back to the late 19th century with, uh, with this uh, first project that, that I'll present, uh, in which I'm trying to analyze the forms of belonging characteristic of the Italian diasporic community settling in the city at the time. And this diasporic community and its forms of association were shaped in relation to the process of Italian unification that was taking place at the time as a result of the articulation of a number of diverse territories and population. And I'm interested in the fact that the reality of the nation preceded the existence of a unified population uh, in ways that were encapsulated in a famous dictum uh, that was popularized at the time. Uh, we've created Italy, now we have to create the Italians. Uh, Architecture, I argue, was to participate in that specific project, the construction of the Italian citizen. Uh, and I'll return to that later in this talk. But the Italian unification was simultaneous to a large diasporic migration that found in New York one of its preferred destinations. Uh, and it's important to note that that uh, diaspora constitutes the largest one in modern history to date, reaching up to 14 million Italians leaving the country in just four decades. Um, in fact, New York became the fourth largest city in number of Italians at the time. Uh, and there, Italian migrants had to shape their forms of belonging abroad in parallel to their search of actual housing and architectural pursuit. Um, significantly, Italian migrants in the city in New York were considered to be not Italians because they've never been Italians, rejected, as you can read, uh, even by their own compatriots. Uh, at play uh, in those arguments, uh, was the rejection of Southern populations in the construction of the Italian model citizens. And this is something that was as important back in Italy as it was in America. And it is the possibility to produce Italians and to produce non-citizens that I'm trying to explore in my research, uh, looking at the way in which architecture mediated these processes of citizenship granting, considering, for example, the role of floor plans like this, uh, or even others uh, earlier ones like this. Uh, and my argument is that uh, the, a number of housing def design reforms taking place in New York at the turn of the century in which uh, these floor plans were discussed uh, were shaped fundamentally as a response to the arrival of migrants uh, and to the development of different diasporic communities uh, and that architecture shaped uh, those communities at the same time. Photographer and housing activist Jacob Rees uh, was a protagonist voice of those reforms and simultaneously provided an exceptional chronicle for those transformations of uh, architectural interiors. Uh, here you have one of his well-known photographs in which he significantly brought to light the living conditions of the New York City tenements, uh, this one featuring an Italian household. His goal, uh, the goal of uh, Rees, was uh, to denounce the ways in which uh, what he called the other half leaves, uh, a goal that provided the title for this famous book. Uh, and while framed in the title as a cohesive half, uh, his analysis of the life uh, within the tenements was organized through the different diasporic communities settling in the city with chapters dedicated to each of them. And you see uh, one dedicated to the Italians. Um, in fact, Rees uh, significantly considered that the tenement typology was a natural environment for the reproduction of a specific attitudes which he deemed uh, characteristic of each of these diasporic communities. Uh, his analysis, in fact, linked uh, different problems of the tenement uh, with the ethnicities of these communities, and this applied to Italians as well. And I quote, um, in New York, the Italian promptly reproduces conditions of destitution and disorder, which set in the framework of Mediterranean exuberance are the delight of the artist, but in a matter of fact, American community become its danger and reproach. Uh, this reproduction is made easier in New York because the, he, the Italian, finds the material ready to hand in the worst, uh, slum, uh, in the worst of the slum tenements. Uh, so while Rees uh, became notorious as a housing activist uh, for denouncing the technical problems of the tenements, the fact that they didn't have good ventilation and things like that, uh, he, um, uh, uh, as you can see in this argument, uh, this pursuit was also guided by the goal of normalizing the populations that lived within them, that is, their assimilation through architecture to American practices and ideas. Uh, and this normalization was particularly committed to shaping the family as a privileged social formation in America. 
By far, he argued, the largest parts of crimes are perpetrated by individuals who have lost connection with home life uh, or whose homes have ceased to be sufficiently separate to afford the influences of home and family. Countering this analysis, and in spite of the difficult conditions in which uh, people were forced to live in the tenements, as you can see in his photograph, the expanded uh, households that Ruiz criticized, the fact that many people live together in these tenements, uh, provided alternative networks of support and recognition uh, for Italians, uh, networks of support that expanded beyond the family, networks that were fundamentally uh, 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 shaped to compensate uh, the virtual lack of citizenship of Italians in America. Some have argued that these uh, expanded corridors that increasingly characterize uh, the, the tenements, as you can see in this floor plan, provided a, an a architectural manifestation that supported those expanded networks because increasingly more and more rooms could directly open into the corridor, uh, allowing for more people that were not part of the same family to live together uh, within these households. Um, Reese's uh, attentive analysis recorded also the way in which uh, these different communities established themselves uh, in the city to enhance these diverse networks of support uh, within each uh, diasporic community. And I quote, uh, the foreign influx uh, in New York distributes itself along certain well-defined lines uh, due to a feeling of dependence upon mutual effort natural to strangers in a strange land. He was describing this map uh, uh, when making these arguments. Uh, in fact, looking for different forms of support, Italians reach beyond the networks of kin provided within the household uh, through other architectures of belonging operating at an urban scale. Um, and many of these manifested in performances that were uh, mediated by religion. Ries uh, reported how these performances revealed the internal diversity of Italians in the city with sections within Little Italy establishing direct uh, correspondences with different Italian regions. Uh, and these were rendered visible through the same patrons uh, celebrated uh, in each street in New York. Uh, and I quote, as St. Rock rules Mulberry Street, so Thompson Street is preempted by St. Anthony of Padua, he argued, suggesting that each of these streets uh, would be ce celebrating a different saint due to the different origins uh, of its neighbors back in Italy. So living uh, with people uh, from the same location uh, back in Italy would have initially facilitated the articulation of belonging for Italians uh, abroad. However, while religious performances were many times celebrated uh, around these regional demarcations, we also discussed the role that uh, was played by the Church of the Lady of Mount Carmel, which significantly brought all Italians together at a time when Italians uh, didn't even come together in their own country. So it is the articulation of these different communities of Italians in New York, uh, both within the household and in the city that I'm interested in studying, considering the relationship between architecture and the different networks of care and support that were consolidated uh, in these community relations. Um, and while I'm considering these questions uh, in this academic project uh, as a historian, uh, I also ask myself, what would have happened uh, if the problems that Ruiz identified in the tenements uh, would have been separated from the social project uh, built around the family in America, the one that ended up consolidating the single family home or the uh, family apartment as the only possible solution for housing. Could we consider new architecture supporting uh, social formations, challenging the links between citizenship uh, with the family and the nation. And this is something that I'm doing as a designer. And I'm bringing this uh, project to emphasize the links between some of my academic endeavors, the projects that I develop uh, as a historian within an academic setting with some of that my design uh, work uh, outside academia. And these are the questions that I've developed in a housing project uh, in response to a call for proposals by the IBA in a project that I developed with the Open Workshop in San Francisco. The call asked to reconcile industrial facilities with housing in the suburban neighborhood of Wilhelmsburg in Hamburg, uh, Germany, and different to the association of uh, the suburbs with single family home ownership that characterizes uh, many places uh, prevalent uh, fundamentally in the US. Uh, this neighborhood mixes industrial facilities with populations lacking stability, including many migrants uh, and young uh, people working together and currently hosts also a large number of refugees. 
in part uh, due to the large uh, migration uh, to locations similar to Wilhelmsburg in Germany, uh, the notion of residence has become a contentious uh, concept and a disputed context uh, uh, in many European locations. Uh, the term Heimat, uh, linking home and homeland, uh, has channeled many of these discussions in Germany. According to a local journalist, in fact, uh, in the recent regional elections, every party allegedly claimed the term Heimat for themselves, even if uh, with uh, different political um, uh, orientations, including the uh, radical uh, right uh, AFD uh, party. But I'm also interested in a scenes like these taking place in this very neighborhood uh, where Javad Sarempour, uh, an Iranian refugee, is being hosted by an aging family to which uh, he provides care. So these uh, scenes of uh, care and support uh, are the ones that I'm interested in uh, supporting with this project. Uh, so the project uh, speculates on architectural capacity to grant uh, these different populations with recognition, uh, the populations inhabiting the neighborhood uh, without equating that recognition necessarily with uh, property uh, and aims to facilitate networks of support among these populations reaching beyond the family. To develop uh, this agenda, the project prepares a series of uh, protocols uh, to negotiate a series of uh, participatory processes, including on the one hand domestic arrangements that seek to facilitate different modes of collective habitation, uh, including uh, different forms of co-living, uh, and on the other hand, workspaces expanding in complementary productive facilities, hosting different models of collective management, including work cooperatives. The project proposes a, a key typological operation to combine these different components, hybridizing the housing perimeter block that you see consolidating the, the, each of these blocks uh, here with housing in the perimeter and uh, the, black, uh, the big box architecture of productive facilities occupying the center of each of these blocks. Um, a series of uh, circuits uh, tied the different components of the project together without over, the, over determining uh, their use or their relation with each other, uh, uh, which would only be um, consolidated later through its performance. And you can see the um, circuits in red, both in the floor plans and in these uh, collages. Uh, and here you can see some of the open spaces in the rooftop uh, where those uh, circuits uh, end up uh, uh, consolidating. The use of timber construction technologies responds uh, to the requirements of both uh, uh, of the different types uh, combining the project and simultaneously links their associated imaginations. Uh, you can see here a section where you see the different components of the project, the perimeter housing, the central collective uh, production facilities, the circuits, uh, and some of the houses that uh, are located on top of the skylights that illuminate these uh, central spaces. So with these uh, operations, the project uh, aims to participate in shaping what I'm suggesting we could call diasporic futurities, uh, build forms that are behind new ways of being together characteristic of a life in transit, where different forms of collective living might be uh, explored. Uh, but while, while I aim to explore the relationship between uh, architecture and diverse social forms, I'm wary of attempts to establish deterministic relationships uh, between the forms of architecture and those of society. So far from those frameworks, I'm interested in the way in which uh, spatial relations articulated with uh, different management systems and performances might trigger material links uh, and collaborations within the project. Uh, and I borrow from uh, theories Donna Haraway, a way of conceptualizing the coalitions uh, saved in those collaborations as they are based on affinities and not on identities, uh, thus rejecting some of the implications of the term HIMAT. Uh, I insist on this term, HIMAT, uh, since uh, my interest on architecture's participation in processes of citizenship granting follows an academic investigation of architecture's role in the consolidation of communities bridging the house and the nation, just uh, as the term HIMAT uh, suggests. Uh, and this is the second academic project that I wanted to present to you. Looking again uh, back to Italy in this uh, other historical research, uh, I argue that if nationalism aimed to build Italians, as I mentioned before, then domestic interiors uh, were one of the ways in which that project was developed, uh, particularly throughout the fascist period. 
In fact, I, I, a large impetus uh, that developed at the time aimed to link the furnishing of a house and the shapes of the nation, or as uh, art critic Hugo Jetty had it, to link the chair and the homeland. Uh, in this pursuit, uh, architects negotiated the internal diversity of the nation uh, and the project to quote unquote build Italians. Uh, with uh, the dissolution of national characteristics triggered by modernization and the fascist regime's search for the cohesion of the nation. The term uh, arredamento, which uh, architects used throughout the period to refer to architecture interiors, may be read as an evidence uh, of this negotiation, for the term in Italian refers both to an individual furniture item and to the ensemble of elements that furnishes a space. And it is this tension between the distinct parts uh, and the pursuit for a cohesive whole that the figure of arredamento encapsulates uh, and uh, that architects uh, negotiated at the time. So I want to argue that the coordination of different pieces of furniture allowed architects to participate in the management and synchronization of Italian society. In fact, I read this pursuit of coordination as a response to the perceived dissolution of Italy, uh, of the Italian country and its fragmentation. Consider, for example, these drawings uh, of multiple interior distributions of furniture in Giopontis uh, design process for the Abitazione Demonstrativa. Following the logics of arredamento, changing uh, organizations are defined here uh, by the furniture themselves with elements hesitantly sketched uh, in different positions. And not only were those distributions uh, unstable, but the constitutive elements of this interior were characteristically diverse, featuring different forms, ornamental motifs, and diverse patterns for the upholstery and carpets, as you can see in this uh, colored photograph. Um, bringing them together was uh, what I'm suggesting we call the project of arredamento. Uh, but more importantly, uh, in presenting this project, Ponti suggested that the interior represented, uh, and I quote, all the postulates and propaganda that I'm doing with Domos and Corriere della Sera, publications with which uh, he was trying to unify the forms of living of Italians. So the unification, as I'm trying to argue, happened not only within the interior, but uh, uh, at the scale of the nation with principles that he made analogous to the logics of political propaganda. And that's uh, the word that he used uh, in presenting that project. Uh, in this pursuit of linking interiors to specific modes of living, uh, characteristic of Italians, not only magazines, but other media, including film, played a cri critical role at the time with furniture pieces uh, regarded as film characters in dialogue with the inhabitants of the nation. Critic uh, Eduardo Persico, for example, celebrated this famous Miss van der Rohe chair because he said, it's the most similar to us. Uh, it resembles our sister dressed for tennis. Uh, and the us that uh, was identified in this argument uh, was not only the reader of the magazine that was uh, going through these pages, uh, but the inhabitant of the Italian house as shaped uh, with these different media. In fact, uh, that house repeatedly included uh, these chairs despite their foreign origin. Um, the sign was not only critical in defining the inhabitants of the Italian home, but it was also important uh, to shape its other, as you can see in this argument. Uh, in this case, the style liberty was what Italians were not uh, identified with uh, and the inhabitants of the provinces, uh, as you can uh, read here. So Italians would be the metropolitan kind of elites uh, of uh, uh, the cities uh, in the north of the country. But this nation furnishing project uh, reached larger territories beyond the cities and manifested also in projects for tourism in these beautiful fur plants by Gio uh, Ponti. You see how this uh, kind of mobile furniture would be colonizing these interiors uh, in these uh, houses for tourism. And even beyond architects helped uh, to furnish the growing colonial empire with furniture aiming to shape, according to Carlo Enrico Rava, colonial hierarchies and racial relationships with this furniture, imagine to travel the territories of the colonies uh, in order to participate in those hierarchies and relations. Uh, so it is in hoping to give shape and consolidate these different uh, spaces uh, from the Italian house to the spaces of the nation that designers characteristically brought together fragmentary elements uh, that you see also represented in this uh, cover of the magazine Lo Stile in pursuit of new forms of cohesion. And in this case, this pursuit for social binding and stabilization was built along the impetus of fascism framed around the nation. 
in my work as a designer, I've uh, looked uh, for alternatives uh, to those forms of binding explored in this previous academic project. And that's, for example, the goal of this house, uh, which I developed uh, uh, with Taller de Dos and is currently under construction in Madrid. The project responds uh, to recent trends in suburban houses in the city of Madrid, uh, all of which aim to reinforce the house as an autonomous space of belonging for the family, which as you can see is systematically rooted on traditional Castilian imaginations. And these are houses all occupying the two or three blocks surrounding the uh, block in which uh, we are building our house. Um, the clients for this project are far from interested in those kind of Castilian imaginations and have quite an eclectic taste uh, with a collection of furniture from different parts of the world. Uh, more importantly, uh, their domestic relations, uh, the domestic relations of these clients are far from those predicated around the conventional idea of the family or any notion of rootedness. Uh, with their daughters all living abroad and increasingly uh, physical dependencies due to their age, uh, the couple likes to host other friends uh, in, and regularly needs uh, the support of attendants for extended periods, constituting what could be conceptualized as an extended family. Uh, making space for those networks and dependencies, the project transforms the conventional row house uh, uh, type in Spain, which traditionally uh, divides the day and night spaces in different floors uh, by hybridizing a loft like apartment for the couple with a bedroom and living spaces here uh, in the main floor and, more and a more conventional sequence of uh, uh, bedrooms and living spaces in the upper floor for those uh, uh, friends and attendants living with the couple. The consolidation of a complete apartment in one floor uh, aims to facilitate the life of the couple that has increasing mobility difficulties so that they don't need to use the stairs uh, of the house. And here you can see uh, the section where uh, you can uh, uh, see the this is the apartment uh, that uh, with these uh, skylights uh, it pretends to be a one floor house, even though it has on top this other sequence of, of uh, uh, bedrooms and living spaces on top. And you see here the relationship between the skylights and the staggering shape of the uh, upper floor uh, here in this model. Some cross section uh, here where you see the same, like the, the sequence of the skylights and the staggering uh, floor plan in the upper floor. The main floor of the house is covered in blue ceramic and the upper floor is uh, undulated aluminum disguised as if part of the roof. Uh, in fact, the house rejects uh, the more monumental celebration of suburban living uh, that are common in the area and instead minimizes its presence uh, with a more compact volume uh, with this uh, sequence of setbacks uh, that uh, facilitate the kind of distribution of light uh, in the garden uh, where an alternative ecology can coexist with uh, that of the domestic networks cultivated within the house. Uh, the project does uh, counters hegemonic notions of the family as an uh, autonomous and rooted social unity uh, and acknowledges the relations of dependency between the inhabitants' bodies uh, and these kind of expanded familial networks uh, as well as these forms of ecology developing in the garden. The different research uh, and design projects that I've presented so far uh, respond to a larger concern uh, with the way in which uh, contemporary spaces of residence are transformed by the growing circulation of people, images, and goods throughout the territory. Yes. Um, considering how these circulatory processes make uh, attachments to places and collectivities increasingly fleeting. Uh, and these were some of the questions uh, addressed in the curatorial project After Belonging, which served as a framework for the 2016 Oslo Architecture Triennale. I developed this project together with the After Belonging agency, including Marina Otero, Carlos Minguez, Alejandro Nararete, and Luis Alexandre. Uh, and our goal in this project was to inspect the ways in which architecture participates in defining our attachment to places and collectivities and with the objects we own, share, and exchange. Uh, and here I'm gonna show you a curatorial project that comes from my academic interest, but expands again outside academia. So I'm trying to uh, kind of create these relationships between some of the interests developed uh, in more kind of traditional academic settings as a form of historical research with some of the projects happening outside academia. Contemporary spaces of, of residence are being transformed by flows of circulation, bringing 
greater accessibility to ever new commodities and further geographies. Uh, but those same circulatory processes also promote growing inequalities for large groups, uh, which are kept in precarious transit. Um, in fact, uh, we were interested in the relevance that, that some of the questions that we were addressing in the Strianale uh, had, uh, or the way in which they echoed uh, the, some of the concerns with the so-called refugee crisis that happened in 2015 uh, in Europe. Uh, and still we sought to avoid uh, operating under a paradigm of crisis or uh, kind of um, exploring a problem solving attitude as if the architect would have the capacity to solve these kind of large problems uh, on his or her own. Uh, in fact, uh, the concerns that are obvious in the large architectural deployments of the refugee camps, uh, like this one, um, made uh, kind of evident uh, the, the stabilizations that we aim to address, but we didn't want to embrace uh, them as the only manifestation of those concerns. In fact, we wanted to locate uh, these concerns with, mo with mobility and the forms of belonging that are possible in this transient world uh, with other architectural uh, transformations happening around the world and where kind of neighborliness and citizenship uh, were being negotiated. Um, with this interest, we decided to study some case studies in the Scandinavian region, including examples like uh, the one you have in the screen. And this is an apartment uh, which was originally part of a massive program with which the Swedish government uh, aimed to alleviate the housing shortage in cities with 1 million houses built in the 1960s. And, but now these apartments are fundamentally inhabited by transnational migrants. Uh, and while the original layouts, uh, modernist layouts, uh, typically aim to accommodate Swedish families with one or two kids, uh, now they have to accommodate diverse families and forms of association. Uh, and it is those kind of architectural transformations that we wanted to study. And we also looked uh, at architectures of asylum seeker centers like this one in Oslo, which are initially supposed to provide a very temporary shelter during the process of asylum applications, uh, but end up hosting some individuals for more than five years. Uh, and it is the sifting populations of this center that the index current international conflicts and thus replicate them in its few square meters, uh, making the questions of neighborliness uh, and the negotiations of inhabitation that are necessary for places like these particularly relevant. Uh, Norwegian law actually doesn't address any of these kind of negotiations and just is just concerned with the mandate to provide shelter to all of its inhabitants, uh, defining this shelter as sparse but safe. Uh, that's the only concern of the law. And we were rather interested in the way in which these negotiations of belonging in spaces like this uh, asylum, seeker cent asylum seeker center were negotiated within architecture. We also considered uh, the role of commercial platforms in articulated uh, contemporary spaces of belonging in the region. Consider, for example, this naive version of belonging that is offered uh, by Airbnb and aware of the legal difficulties that many have to settle and belong in different territories. Uh, and yet the operations of this platform are, are, are critically intervened by architecture which here works to enhance uh, a Nordic idea of homeliness through different uh, design strategies, uh, seeking to make us tourists, quote unquote, feel at home in these different uh, dispersed interiors in the region. So these were some of the examples uh, that helped us shape the curatorial framework of the Oslo Architecture Triennale, which we define as an exploration of the ways in which we differently define home today and diverse understandings of belonging based on those transformations. So we organized uh, two exhibitions uh, in which belonging was explored uh, not as a stable bond, uh, but, uh, but as a contentious affiliation. Uh, the exhibitions gather a number of projects which we organized uh, in constellations around shared conversations. Uh, and some of the pieces uh, feature included uh, like, for example, OMA's work on home sharing platforms uh, or Design Earth's uh, speculation on the ecopolitical communities of the Pacific Ocean, the constellations by artist uh, Bukha Kalili, among uh, many other pieces like this uh, speculation on remittances by Frida Escobedo. 
that's the plan of the exhibition. And a second exhibition provided a speculative platform around 10 case studies of residential spaces around the world with reports commissioned to different professionals. So, and as you can see here, like each of these kind of constellations uh, dedicated to one of these uh, sites. Uh, one of our goals as curator was not only to feature the work of well-known offices, uh, but to sponsor new forms of practice. Uh, and in fact, we did so with a call for intervention strategies that were developed uh, in specific sites. Uh, these interventions resulted in different projects ranging from a collective archive and new forms of representation for asylum seekers uh, to an app exacerbating the logics of sharing platforms. Uh, we also organized different platforms of discussion uh, and forms of exchange at an academic level, um, as well as a book including scholarly reflections on the topic. So again, bringing together practice and academic uh, practice, uh, or, or let's say design practice and academic practice throughout the Triennale. And finally, we also wanted to mobilize uh, architecture's capacity to support uh, specific activist projects uh, related to the topic. Uh, and that was the case of the embassy built uh, by Jonas Stahl with the communities of Rojava in northern Syria, which was located uh, in the Oslo City Hall. Uh, the project referred back to Norway's uh, diplomatic tradition in order to bring together different scholars and activists concerned with the construction of uh, stateless democracies. So in this case, as you can see, the academic dimension of uh, my uh, explorations uh, of residence and transients and belonging was developed in different platforms for engagement and discussion rather than necessarily as a kind of a traditional historical project. And I want to finish uh, uh, with a couple of projects that aim to contribute to these uh, pursuit uh, seeking to craft infrastructures gathering diverse uh, collectives. Uh, the first one was asked uh, to participate in the consolidation of urban relationships in Medellin, in Colombia, in response to a fragile, to the fragile context of the city. Uh, this context uh, resulted from processes of rapid urbanization following the large migration from the countryside into the city as a result of the recent civil war in Colombia. The project, which uh, won uh, the first prize in an international competition, aimed to facilitate the appropriation of public spaces in the city, in addition to supporting the strong cyclist uh, culture of the country with a new velodrome. And with this goal, the project integrates uh, two seemingly incompatible spatial conditions. Uh, the centralized and formally specific uh, uh, characteristic of the velodrome um, and the kind of continuity of the public spaces of the park in which the velodrome is located. So uh, uh, we did that by creating this platform that, uh, that is uh, defined in continuity with the park, goes up and then carves uh, the space for the velodrome uh, and a series of uh, um, units uh, creating the roof, but dissolving its boundaries, creating kind of this continuity between uh, the, the spaces of uh, the park and the uh, covering of the velodrome rather than enclosing a space, uh, a continuous space. And you can see that in these sections where the platform goes up, then carves this space, and the units uh, that create the, the um, roof uh, are uh, creating kind of this uh, continuity with the facade. If I go back here, what you see here is that there is a facade that closes uh, when there is a, a competition but remains open the rest of the day, is creating this possibility of going through the building. And you see here kind of uh, the continuity of these spaces. Um, structurally, the roof is composed uh, of tensegrity modules uh, with two of them floating uh, over the, par the, the track and supported by groups of three supports uh, uh, that are holding this big uh, uh, ring side. And you see here some of the constructions, uh, documents, uh, So in this project, uh, I'm interested in architecture's participation in the articulation of communities, not necessarily through a specific program like cycling uh, and not around new symbols as in the conventional understanding of public buildings, uh, but through the different kinds of engagements, affections and performances that the building activates. In fact, in these previous images, you can see some of the kind of artifacts that are imagined to activate this public space uh, defined uh, in coordination with uh, the larger intervention of the project. The project was developed uh, uh, 
together with Giancarlo Massanti and Fake Industries, though it's been on hold uh, for many years and I suppose it will never be built, unfortunately, uh, and that's why at least we're happy that it continues to trigger certain imaginations uh, uh, in the collection of the Pompidou uh, Center. And uh, I'm gonna finish with this uh, more recent project uh, that I also developed with Tayer de Dos, uh, uh, which follows a, a similar pursuit. Uh, the, projects, uh, cons the project consisted on the refurbishment uh, of an old uh, Pelota Stadium, uh, and our goal was to expand the uses and publics uh, invited to this uh, space. Uh, and you see here the original uh, Pelota Stadium uh, and the kind of uh, uh, multiple publics that we imagine uh, could be consolidated uh, in this space. Uh, facilitating access uh, by, uh, to this space with universal uh, uh, accessibility measures uh, that were lacking in prior, prior uh, in the building. You see here the entrance uh, to the building through the back of the project. Uh, and here you'll understand that the image is uh, through this uh, street that provides access to this space with uh, an expanded ramp and a series of ramps located in this wall that is actually the uh, fundamental to the uh, game of Pelota that uses these two uh, walls uh, facilitate universal access to all the, uh, support uh, all the support spaces and the seats uh, that are located in this area. So here you see uh, that ramp coming down, all the ramps organizing circulation and giving access to these uh, uh, spaces. Our kind of uh, op more typological operations were uh, in contrast with the entries of other offices, uh, which focus fundamentally on covering the space. Uh, and uh, we got second prize. So unfortunately, we will not develop this uh, project, but we were interested in kind of these kind of accumulation of activities that were pos made possible by those ramps uh, in the space of uh, these court mixing different spaces, collectives, uh, just like in the uh, velodrome we were uh, hoping to do. Like in other projects I've shown, architecture here operates upon the ways in which buildings might participate in the articulation of alternative social formations and bringing together diverse users and uses. Um, so to conclude, uh, my goal so in all these different projects has been twofold. Uh, on the one hand, I aim to illustrate uh, my desire to have architecture participate in different processes of social articulation, particularly in considering how those processes relate uh, to the definition of contemporary spaces of residence uh, within the increasingly deterioralized condition of modern and contemporary societies. And second, I aim to illustrate the ways in which I try to relate the forms of inquiry characteristic of academia, where I work as a historian, uh, to different design and curatorial projects that I developed uh, uh, outside academia. So working with uh, the rigorous perspective uh, provided by historical scholarship and the critical imaginations allowed by design thinking, I hope to contribute to define new forms of uh, being together that are challenging the relationship between home and property that has been intensified by advanced capitalism and away also from the exacerbated forms of nationalism, which are also sadly, uh, sadly expanding these days. Uh, so maybe with that goal, uh, I'll end my talk. Uh, it's uh, um, here is 10.15, so I imagine it's 3.15 there, uh, and I'm happy to have questions for the next uh, uh, 15 minutes. So. so yes, I open the floor for the students who are with us today, if there are some questions. If not, I can start with, with the question to you. So um, I think you, you explain how your academic background or your academic uh, career influenced uh, your, um, your architecture practice. So it, it's quite clear in, in, the, in, in this. So, but how do you, how do you uh, define yourself right now? So you will be more an academic or you're more uh, a practitioner? Or, and, how these two uh, things works together for you? Yeah, um, I don't know how I define myself. Like uh, I try to avoid uh, those identity concerns. Like uh, I just, I'm, I'm a person concerned uh, with uh, the nature of belonging in the contemporary period, I would say. And I try to address those concerns uh, 
through different media, both in my writing, when I work as a historian, uh, when I do design projects in curatorial platforms. Uh, and I think that uh, those kind of the, the kind of uh, education that uh, we have as uh, designers or interior designers in your case, allows us to explore those concerns uh, in very diverse forms. So I don't think it's necessary to kind of uh, the limit uh, what are the ways in which we operate, let's say, uh, with, um, um, with those tools. Uh, and I'm more interested rather in expanding uh, the way in which our expertise allows us to participate in relevant questions that we are facing today. Let's see. Thank you. So somebody else has a question for Ignacio? It's true, like what we were for questions, it's true that the kind, that kind of the expertise uh, that one uses when working as a, like in academia, as a historian, uh, is very different uh, from the one um, at play in a design project. Even the software that you use, like uh, the, like when I'm writing, like uh, I'm kind of, uh, it requires us kind of a professional education in the management of uh, kind of, um, materials, the software even that you use as a historian is different. Uh, but I think that uh, we are, uh, as designers, very well prepared to challenge those kind of uh, conventional uh, um, limits. In fact, uh, there are many genealogies in which uh, uh, designers have operated in like uh, transgressing boundaries between design, activism, history, right, and like uh, I, I think that uh, I'm not uh, studying anything that like many other people have done. Like, uh, so there is a tradition of challenging those uh, uh, boundaries uh, in architecture. Uh, and I think that uh, it's good to continue challenging them. Did you went straight after, I mean, after you graduating from the architectural school, you went straight to the PhD, always having another parallel path with the with the practice? Um, I started as a, an, I studied architecture in Madrid and Delft uh, and then worked for some years in an architecture practice uh, in Madrid while I was teaching at the School of Architecture in Madrid. Uh, then I went to the United States to study a master's in architecture at Harvard. Uh, and my goal there was actually to just go do a master's and return to Spain. But uh, at Harvard, I discovered my passion for history writing. And then after the master's, uh, I started my PhD in Princeton. So I went straight from the master's to the PhD, but I had worked before as an architect uh, mm -hmm. uh, for some years while teaching. Um, and then while I started doing my PhD, I continued with, with my architectural practice and with different curatorial projects. Uh, including like uh, some of the, and them relating to my PhD dissertation. So for example, the project that I did at the Venice Biennale of 2014 was very directly related to my uh, academic uh, uh, PhD, but doing other projects that were less uh, necessarily kind of linked uh, to that dissertation. Hope this gives some ideas to our master's student how to engage then next on a PhD. Uh, I don't know if there are other questions from the student. Don't be shy. But at the same time, I know they, they will, I think most of them have with you a more private conversation. I think in a little bit more than a half an hour. So maybe they yeah, save in an the hour, question. Right? I yeah. think uh, we're it's, meeting in an hour. Um, uh, I don't remember, it's 4, 4 30. I have to check again, but probably it's 4 30. Um, so, yes, if there are no other questions. Thanks again, Ignacio, for telling us all this interesting project and research. And uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank Perfect. You very much. I hope you are more talkative uh, later in the <laughs> seminar because uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to do it much more brief. Uh, so get uh, ready for that conversation. Thank you. Bye. Perfect.